There we go. Today, we are opening a brand new unit. This is very exciting. Um, we are starting our first big project, our first big unit. Um, this is, this is, there are sort of four big projects that you're going to do over the course of your junior year at Freestyle Academy. And this is the first big one. This is your very first big project. This is the experimental unit. And we are opening the experimental unit today. So a, a word of caution about the experimental unit. The experimental unit will stretch you in ways that you did not think to be stretched. Um, the experimental unit, there is a reason why we do it at the beginning of the school year. And it is because we want you to think differently. It will inform your decisions as you move forward. It will help you think abstractly. It will help you think out of the box. The experimental unit is very different. Experimental films are very different than films that you are accustomed to. Okay. They are a little bit weird sometimes. They're a little bit strange sometimes. Some of you are going to love experimental filmmaking. Some of you are going to hate experimental filmmaking. All of you will benefit tremendously from experimental filmmaking because experimental filmmaking not only stretches you and helps you grow and think differently in ways that you haven't done things before, but it also will help inform your film decisions in the future, whether you're working on a narrative film or a documentary film or a music video or a movie trailer, whatever it may be. Experimental filmmaking will help you learn to display emotions in film visually um, and help you reach your audience in different and different ways than maybe you didn't realize that you could. So um, what I'm saying is uh, experimental filmmaking, get ready, strap in. It's a bit of a ride. It's a little bit different. Um, and if you are someone who gets into this and you decide, ooh, I do not like experimental filmmaking, you know what? That's okay. You don't have to like it. Okay. But trust me, Trust me when I say you will benefit from it. Your skills will improve and experimental filmmaking will help your skills in other facets of the film industry and other projects that you work on, whether it's narrative film or documentary film or so on and so forth. So bear with me, stick with me. Uh, if you're someone who has difficulty thinking in this sort of abstract way and you're not a big fan of experimental film, on the other hand, some of you in this room are gonna love experimental film and think it's wonderful and it's the best thing Ever, and you're going to really enjoy it. Um, and, I think, um, and I think you will realize quickly um, which of those camps you fall into. So without further ado, I will bring up my slides on experimental filmmaking. Avant-garde, avant-garde and experimental filmmaking. This is our opening lesson on experimental film. How many of you have heard the term avant-garde before? I don't say it right. I don't have the French accent. Does anyone here have a French accent or speak French? Anyone? Anyone care to pronounce it correctly for us? Anybody? Anybody? Jonah, you were like thinking about it. I did French for two years, but uh, not the accent part. Okay. <laughs> I think, I think there's a little bit of like an E at the end, like avant-garde. You know, Clement from uh, design is French. Okay, there you go. That's good knowledge, good knowledge. All right, so um, avant-garde. Avant so that's what we'll be talking about today. So avant-garde, what is avant-garde? Have, have, who's heard the term before? Has anyone heard the term before? Okay, cool. Does anyone want to take a stab at what the definition of the term is? Any brave souls out there? I did my whole opening intro where I yelled at all of you. Now you're all terrified to say anything. Anyone want to take a stab at it? Avant-garde, what might it mean? I'll be nice, I promise. Um, it's like unusual art and like okay. experimental art. <laughs> experimental. It's experimental. We're doing experimental films. It must be experimental. Very good, Daria. It is experimental. Congratulations. You're, you're catching on. Um, it is, it is experimental and it is, um, it is sometimes kind of weird and kind of different. Um, but it, it covers more definitions than that as well. So, um, it came out of modernism, which is sort of a, a period in our art history. Okay. Um, it is a French word, as I mentioned, and it means advance guard. So guard in advance, like ahead of times sort of thing. 
Okay. Um, so it is kind of often associated with sort of thinking ahead, sort of, you know, like before, before thinking, um, you know, like cutting edge sort of stuff, right. You know, like, so cutting edge, like maybe we're not even ready for it kind of stuff. Okay. Um, it's often associated with people or works, uh, that are innovative, that are different from normal. Okay. Um, and it doesn't have to be just filmmaking. It can be any kind of art. It can be literature, film, music. It can be fashion. It can be politics. Okay. It can be any real, it can be any aspect of our culture um, that, it, that can include the, a different way of thinking, an innovative way of thinking or a cutting edge way of thinking um, or a way of thinking that is so new, it, it might be a little jarring even, okay? So it can be associated with many different aspects of our culture. You could apply it to the tech industry here in Silicon Valley if you wanted to, you know? I think when, when, when you know, Steve Jobs maybe first envisioned his first smartphone, right? That was probably that same sort of avant-garde type of idea, right? So um, avant-garde um, has been known to push boundaries all right. Um, it is often associated with surrealism. The design students at, at Freestyle are learning about surrealism right now because it sort of links in with this same sort of topic. Okay. Um, it is sometimes linked with social reforms. It's, remember, it's not just art. It's anything in our culture. So stuff that happens socially in our culture can often be described as avant-garde. Um, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it is opposed to the mainstream because it's sort of a forward thinking idea, a forward thinking concept, a cutting edge thinking concept. I said, sometimes it's so cutting edge, maybe we're not ready for it, right? Maybe, maybe there's pushback, maybe culture, maybe it's a little bit against culture. Maybe it's a little bit opposed to the mainstream culture. Okay. Um, and then of course it is oftentimes experimental. Um, meaning that we are kind of playing with ideas. We're not really sure if they're good ideas. We're not really sure what the result of them is going to be, but we're experimenting with them and trying them out and, and so on and so forth. Which brings us to, of course, experimental filmmaking, the cinema side of this avant-garde idea, which is where we as film students will be living in for the next month or so, okay? So avant-garde cinema, like what does that actually mean? Well, the experimental film covers a number of different ideas. It's all these same concepts that we talked for, talked about. It's different. It's unconventional. It can, it can, it can be in opposition to mainstream culture or media. Okay, not always the case, but often is the case. Okay. Um, oftentimes it's associated with a thought, an idea, an emotion, or a feeling. Okay, this, and now this is something that I want you to really think about. Oftentimes it's associated with a thought, an idea or emotion or a feeling. Experimental filmmaking oftentimes has nothing to do with a narrative. Okay, we're not talking about a character who goes on a journey, who has a beginning and a middle and an end and then learns a lesson at the end. And then that, that's, a, that's a story. Experimental filmmaking is not always a story. In fact, often it's not. Oftentimes experimental filmmaking maybe has an underlining message some sort of social idea or concept or something like that. But sometimes, oftentimes, it's just associated with an idea or a concept or an, or an emotion or a feeling. You know, like, what, what might it look like if I was to capture the look of excitement? What does excitement look like? The emotion. Not, not, not someone who's feeling excited. That's different. I don't want to film somebody who's feeling excited. I want to film the actual emotion. It's intangible. It's abstract. It doesn't exist. It's not, it's not something that we can hold on to and, and actually see. But what would it look like if I could see it? The emotion itself. Right? That's experimental filmmaking. What would the emotion itself look like? And you have to figure out a way, some weird, strange way to capture what the emotion itself looks like on screen. Okay? Um, sometimes experimental films are experimental in method. So sometimes it's about the process and not about the actual theme or the journey. So I'll give you an example. I saw in film school once a film that had been created using stop motion, only it was with people. So they did stop motion with people. Okay, so that was, that's kind of cool. But then the really cool experimental part of this was for their soundtrack, rather than compose a soundtrack or, or get some music and slap it on there. They film this on a film reel. And in film reels, the soundtrack appears kind of on the side, kind of like a waveform. And the, the filmmakers were looking at the film strip and they kind of looked at it and said, hey, I wonder, I wonder what it would sound like 
if instead of recording a soundtrack and having it printed onto the film reel, I wonder what it would sound like if I just took paint and painted my own soundtrack onto the film reel. Like, what would it play back like? What would that sound like? So when you guys were editing in Premiere, you saw the audio tracks and you see all the squiggly lines. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's called a waveform. What would it look like if you painted your waveform instead of actually recorded sound? That's it's the same concept. That's basically what these, what these filmmakers did. So they got out this tiny little paintbrush and they drew all these little dots and they made their own little soundtrack just based on what was happening in the film without knowing how it was going to sound. And the result was amazing. It's this weird sort of like almost computery, like, doo -doo 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 like weird kind of soundtrack. And it totally fits that stop motion look. And it became a, a well, a well-known independent little mini film that was done um, in Canada. I'll have to show it to you sometime. Um, but that's experimental filmmaking. Sometimes it's about the process. Now, all of you, many of you, if not all of you are very new to filmmaking. Okay. You have an opportunity now in this unit to experiment with new ways of technology, with new ways of creating a film, okay? That's an opportunity for you to try new things because in, a, in an experimental film, it's kind of hard to screw up because it's experimental. It is by nature going to be a little bit different. It's by nature you trying new things and new technologies and new processes. Processes? Processy? Processes? I don't know. Point is, you can experiment with experimental filmmaking and it's not gonna get you in trouble, which is kind of cool. Um, finally, there is what I call art for art's sake. Sometimes I'll go to a modern art museum and I'm not a huge modern art fan, but I have come to appreciate it over the years. And sometimes I'll go to like a modern art museum, uh, like the MoMA in San Francisco, for example. We would, we would take a field trip there normally uh, and that would be super fun. Hopefully maybe at the end of the year, we can still do that. I don't know, we'll see. Um, if not the next year, perhaps. Um, but sometimes when we go to the, the Museum of Modern Art and I'll look around at some of this modern art, I'll say to myself, I don't think this means anything. I think, I think this just looks cool. And it's just art for art's sake. Uh, and sometimes experimental films are like that. They just look cool. They're just art for art's sake. Um, and that is a, t a kind of film that, that you can make when you are making experimental film. Um, oftentimes, experimental filmmakers relate their films to other types of art, other disciplines of art. For example, poetry, okay? The reason why we are doing experimental filmmaking now, uh, there's a few reasons, and I'll explain more at the end of the unit when you're all finished. Um, but one of the big reasons why we are doing experiment, experimental filmmaking right now is because you've also been working on poetry in Mr. Greco's English class, okay? And there's some overlap there. The same kind of thinking applies to experimental film. That sort of different, out of the box, abstract, intangible kind of thinking applies itself to experimental film, okay? And oftentimes experimental filmmakers will relate their works to other types of disciplines. It can be poetry, it can be painting, it can be dance. I've seen experimental films that are, connect, that are connected to dance and they're experimental, but they're dance. And it's like, I can't really explain it, but I'll show it to you at some point. And then you'll nod your head and say, oh yeah, it's experimental dance, but it's a film, but it's dance, but it's film. All right. I just have a few of those. It happens quite often actually. Um, so if you're someone who likes different kinds of art, if you're into poetry, if you're into painting, if you're into abstract art, if you're into dance or, or any of these other types of art, okay, this is an opportunity for you to do some overlap there. That can be kind of cool. Um, experimental filmmaking reevaluates cinematic conventions. That means it breaks a lot of the rules. At the beginning of the year, I told you that film has a language and that you all inherently know that language and that over the course of the next several months, I'm going to teach you how to speak in that language, to speak in film language. Well, experimental filmmaking breaks the rules of all that, of all that language, which is why one of the reasons why it oftentimes feels different. You don't have to follow film rules when you're making an experimental film because it's, it's experimental. There's no, there's no wrong way to do it, okay? Um, oftentimes, there's no budget for these films. It's usually just a, a one filmmaker or a very small crew. Oftentimes, it's amateur filmmakers. Some of the most famous experimental filmmakers in the world got famous making their very first experimental film, and it was their very first film ever. And if they tried to make any other kind of film, they'd, they'd fail tremendously at it. But Again, experimental film is very different. Experimental film is very forgiving. You don't have to be, quote, a filmmaker, an experienced filmmaker with a resume and an IMDb, you know, portfolio, right? You don't have to be a, that type of Hollywood filmmaker 
to make an experimental film. You can be a random person who just wants to try it out, who's an artist. A lot of artists don't know anything about cameras or technology or editing, and they make experimental films, and they get displayed, and they do very well. Okay, so that's kind of one of the nice things about experimental film. On the other hand, you're not going to make any money with an experimental film. You're not going to make a lot of money. You're not going to make your income. Experimental filmmaking is not a job. Um, you, won't, you won't become profitable doing that. Um, very rarely, very rarely. There, there may be one or two um, that I can name, that I will name later, but um, not, not going to happen very often. Um, Again, oftentimes the goal of experimental filmmaking is to just show off a personal vision or just to experiment with new technology. So this can be all of you as you work on your experimental film, okay? You, a lot of this technology is new to you, okay? And, and you all are gonna have, you all are gonna have your own sort of personal vision for what you want to achieve. And I'll explain more about what the assignment actually is uh, at the end of class. All right, so once again, um, you're probably not gonna make a lot of money you're not gonna become famous being an experimental filmmaker, okay? Um, you're not gonna be making a story. It's not gonna be a narrative that has a beginning and a middle and an end, all right? Um, it's, but it might be a lot of fun. You're gonna call attention more to the process. You're gonna call attention to the filmmaking itself. Sometimes experimental films are what we call meta, right? Oh, it's so meta, right? Because the experimental film is talking about the experimental film that you're actually watching right now sometimes. Like it calls attention to itself. That's a, that's a form of filmmaking that we call reflexive filmmaking. I took a whole class in college about reflexive filmmaking. Very interesting concept. Films about the film that you are currently watching in the moment. And it's a sort of a shared experience in that way. Um, one, of, one of perhaps the most um, clear definitions of an experimental film is that it's often hard to interpret. We don't always know what the artist is trying to say. Uh, oftentimes it's very ambiguous or there are many different possible interpretations. You might think it means one thing and your neighbor might think it means something completely different. Uh, experimental filmmakers require the participation of the audience. This is one of the really cool things about experimental film. Okay, we all go to the movie theater sometime, you know, and, and we go to relax and we go to shut off our brain. You know, we go watch a Marvel movie and let's be honest, you don't have to think too much when you watch a Marvel movie, right? Like they're all, they're all kind of the same, right? Okay, we show up, we watch the hero fight the bad guy, you fall asleep in the second act, you wake up, you realize you haven't really missed anything. They have the big battle at the end, it's big and it's wonderful and exciting, and then you go home and you completely forget the whole thing five minutes later, except for that really cool action sequence where they were like, wah, 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 right? All that cool stuff, okay? All right, that's cool, that's fun, but we don't have to think too hard doesn't require a lot from our audience. It doesn't require a lot of audience engagement other than just their enjoyment. When you watch an experimental film, it requires your audience to participate. It requires your audience to think, okay? And this is what separates a great filmmaker, and this is why experimental film can help you in all capacities of filmmaking, including your narrative films and your documentary films and all your other type of work. Because if you require your audience to participate, in your film, you're engaging them at a level that's much higher than the average audience member, right? Now the audience is working for you. Now the audience is part of the film experience. Now they're helping you write your movie in a sense. They're, they're sort of the last part of your crew, right? Which is really a really cool idea. It becomes this shared experience of film where the audience is actually part of the film experience, creating the film and enjoying the film and, and participating in the interpretation of the film. And that's one of the reasons why I, I like experimental films is because it requires the audience to engage at a certain level to get anything out of it. They have to think, they have to think about it and they have to interpret it. And they might interpret it differently and that's fine. They're gonna interpret it very differently. Bryn's gonna interpret it very differently from Chloe and from Jamie and from Vin because we all have different experiences. And that's cool and there's no right answer because it's gonna be unique to that audience member. And it might mean something different to you today than it does tomorrow or next week or next year or 10 years from now. And that's cool, right? Because now the film has sort of replay value, right? Like now, now the film can mean many, many different things and you can get out of the film many different things each time you, each time you watch it. So that's one of the things that I really like about experimental filmmaking um, is that it requires the audience participation and that the concept of requiring your audience to engage with your film is really, really cool and something that can help you become, um, you know, a great filmmaker versus just your average filmmaker who's, who's competent at telling a story. 
Okay. Which brings us to an experimental filmmaker named Maya Duran. I'm going to talk a little bit about Maya Duran. Then we're going to watch a film of hers. It's weird. It's a little strange. Get ready. All right. So Maya Duran, um, here's a picture of her from the film that we are going to watch. Okay. Maya Duran was a experimental filmmaker in the 1940s and the 1950s. She was a choreographer, dancer, film theorist, poet, lecturer, writer, and photographer. Uh, this one could not keep still. She was all over the place. She was an artist who liked to dabble in many different art forms and many different ideas and concepts. I think this is one reason why she was a great experimental filmmaker. Uh, because experimental filmmakers oftentimes latch on to ideas and concepts as opposed to just one sort of process of making a film, right? So she was interested in all of these things. She was interested in dance and psychology, okay? As we watch her film, you might see some concepts of dance or some concepts of psychology, all right? And she liked to explore this idea of films as a stream of consciousness. Have any of you ever done, like in an English class, a stream of consciousness exercise? All right, a couple hands. Okay, cool. This is a cool exercise. If you've never done this, I encourage you to give it a try. You sit down, you get out your pencil or you get out your computer and you just write whatever your brain is thinking, no matter what it is. And it might be totally incoherent. It might not make any sense. It might be all over the place, Batman, fire hydrant, lights, whatever. And it's not, and it's not gonna be, it's just gonna be jumbles of nothingness. And it's a kind of a fun, liberating, freeing exercise for your brain. The brain just kind of does whatever it wants and throws up all over your screen or all over your paper or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and Maya Duren sort of took that concept and said, what would that look like in a film? What would that look like in an experimental film if we could take that stream of consciousness that has no order, that has no organization, and just put that into a film? What might that look like? That's kind of cool. That's kind of a cool idea to explore, right? Um, a very experimental filmmaking idea to explore. So um, that's something that she was sort of interested in. Uh, Maya was very anti-Hollywood. She hated the business of film. Um, here's where Maya and I would have clashed a little bit because I love good narrative filmmaking and she did not like narrative filmmaking. She wanted films as emotions and films as ideas and all that kind of stuff. So she was very, very anti-Hollywood. Um, here's, here's a quote that sort of, gives you an idea of her feelings on, on traditional narrative filmmaking. Uh, quote, artistic freedom means that the amateur filmmaker is never forced to sacrifice visual drama and beauty to the relentless activity and explanations of a plot. Nor is the amateur production expected to return profit on a huge investment by holding the attention of a massive and motley audience for 90 minutes. Can you hear can you hear the disdain in her voice? She doesn't even she doesn't even like the audience. She doesn't even like the people that are paying to see these films. Like let alone the business people who are investing money to keep, hold your attention all that kind of stuff. The motley audience, you know, these poor souls that go watch movie to what to be entertained. My goodness. My goodness. Instead, she says, instead of trying to invent a plot that moves, use movement of wind or water, children, people, elevators, balls, etc. As a poem, might celebrate these and use your freedom to experiment with visual ideas. Your mistakes will not get you fired. Okay, she said this in 1965, which is after she had a successful run as being an experimental filmmaker. So you can see her sort of point of view. Uh, and I respect it. I absolutely respect it because there's a lot of value into freeing yourself from sort of the rules of film language, from freeing yourself, if you were in the business of film, you know, the film industry, from freeing yourself from that industry and just making something that explores a concept or an idea that shows the movement of wind. What does that look like? Or of water or of, or of so on, you know, balls, a po like a poem, you know, and there's beauty in the language itself, right? Just like a poem is beautiful in the way it's written, experimental filmmaking can be beautiful in the way it's, it's put together, even if it doesn't necessarily follow a lot of the normal rules and conventions that we would normally apply to filmmaking. All right, which brings us to her film that we are going to watch together here as a class. It's called Meshes of the Afternoon. Uh, it was made in 1943. Um, and it's a little different. It's a little different. So I'm going to prep my screen here. Um, brace yourself. This is a little bit different. Get comfortable. Put on your fuzzy socks, folks. Um, this is going to take us for about 15 minutes or so. 
Um, everything about this film is very experimental. This is a very well-regarded, a very famous experimental film. And I'll talk about um, sort of how it's influenced the world of experimental filmmaking um, over, over the years. All right, strap in. Here we go.
What'd you think? That was whack. A no, little, little <laughs> different, right? A little different? Something. 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 Um, by show of hands, because I'm always curious, how many of you loved this film? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I had a feeling. I was watching your reactions. Okay, cool, cool. How many of you hated this film? It's okay. You can be honest. I'm not going to hold it against you. Okay. One person. How many of you are like, I just don't know what to think of this film? Okay. That's a lot of us in between. Right. Totally. I get you. Okay. So, um, yeah, this one is, this one's a little different, right? This one's a little bit strange. So before we kind of start analyzing it a little bit, tell me what you think or tell me what you liked or what you didn't like. Was there something that stood out to you? that was like, well, I really liked this part or I really hated this part or I thought this was interesting. So I just want to talk about it just a little bit um, because we got about, I think about 15 minutes or so left. So real quick, tell me some of your, some of your ideas. I liked the part where they all kept trying to pick up the key and like flipping their hand over, but I liked it because it just seemed so useless. Like I didn't understand why the scene was there, so I liked it. Okay, other thoughts? I thought that it was kind of cool um, how the first time that the dude came in afterwards, like he was holding the mirror. And then after that, I think it was broken pieces of the mirror in the ocean. And then when he came back, how there were what I think were shattered pieces of mirror inside the house, along with more like flower stems. And then I couldn't tell if either she had like cut her throat with the pieces of glass or the knife. But I thought that those like dynamics that they all kind of came together at the end for like the final little depressing yet fascinating ending was really cool. Sure. We had, so we had a lot of concepts there, right? So there's a lot of common sort of themes that came up in the use of objects in this particular film. We had a flower, right? We had a key that was coming and going, right? We had the knife, we had the mirror, um, you know, we had concepts of arriving home, right? How many times did she arrive home before, you know, like she did it once and then she did it twice and then she did it three, right? Like she kind of kept arriving, it kind of kept happening over and over and over again, right? She kept chasing that dark sort of hooded figure, right? Um, what do you think this means? Like I, now if she was here, she'd probably say something like, well, it means whatever you think it means because that's what any good experimental filmmaker would say, right? But what do you, what do you think it means? I feel like it was kind of about her sanity in a way because it okay. was like having a normal lifestyle or a normal dynamic, but she kept on chasing this one thing that she was never able to actually grasp. And then the flower was like, I'm not sure what the flower meant, but like throughout the film, she was like repeating the same thing, which was a relatively normal life where you like, you open your door and you go in your house, but then she was chasing this thing over and over again. And in the end, she and the thing had the mirror so it was kind of reflecting her mm -hmm. and she could never catch it and then in the end it was shattered into pieces while she was also dead in the house that was like her normal life oh that's a good that's exactly. a good connection there yeah no that's a good connection there i hadn't considered that um somebody else anyone else Bryn, you're thinking about it i can see it on your face you're like you kind of have a thought but you're like hesitating to say it go ahead no, I don't really know. I liked the beginning of the film and I liked the end of the film, but I felt like in the middle, something about it, like, I don't know, it was like long. And then also I felt like with the objects, I don't know if it's the right word, but it felt a little like gimmicky, you know what I mean? Like, I felt like at some time, like at some points, the vision got a little fuzzy, which it could have been, it, it probably was intentional. And that also it felt long because she was kind of repeating the same thing over and over with like slight variations and like kept having to put the phone back or like kept having to take the thing off the um, record player and like the key out of her mouth, you know, but um, I don't know. How did, um, how did this make all of you feel like what, um, what like i talked about experimental filmmaking oftentimes is tied to the emotion right so great great filmmakers remember great filmmakers are great manipulators they get our audience to feel what they want them to feel right so what is the emotion here what sort of feeling is maya trying to get us to 
trying to get us to have, trying to get us to feel. Um, um, go ahead, Daria. Um, I got really scared. I don't know. I like... I really like horror movies and like stuff like that and I don't get scared very easily but this actually kind of freaked me out a little bit and that's why I liked it. Go ahead Nate. Yeah um the soundtrack really was like kind of anxiety provoking. The whole thing kind of just felt like um a fever dream which was kind of unnerving which I mean the whole thing isn't that scary but that kind of essence of just extreme abstractness is kind of unnerving because you don't know what's going on. So that kind of heightens the sense of anxiety for me, at least. Totally. Totally. So I'm going to put my, my screen back up on here. So we talked about common themes and we already sort of discussed some of these. We had the common theme of the woman arriving home, the man, um, that hooded figure that she was constantly trying to chase but could never seem to capture, right? We had the flower that kept coming into play. The man kept bringing the flower, right? Uh, that knife that kept appearing, right? And then the key, right? So we talked about a lot of these different, um, we, we observed a lot of these different things that kept popping up into the film. And, and oftentimes these things in experimental films have some sort of connection to some, some statement or some idea or some concept. They're symbols, or something they don't the key represents something else the knife represents something else um and i like what nate said about it feeling like a fever dream because i think maya wanted this to feel like a dream right we have that that feeling of her chasing after the hooded figure but never catching up right how many of you have had that kind of dream before or seen that kind of dream in other kinds of films and, and media right where you can't quite catch up to that thing or where it repeats itself over and over and over again, or where people sort of appear and reappear, but then they're actually somebody else, right? You ever had that in a dream? I have, right? Where all of a sudden the person that was your best friend is actually you, but now it's somebody else, but it's normal in the context of your dream and your brain's like, yeah, it's fine. It's cool. It's normal. Right. And then you wake up and you're like, this doesn't make any sense because when we, in, in our, our rational mind tries to narrate, make it a narrative, right? But our dreams are experimental films. It's your brain making an experimental film in a way. Um, and Maya, I think, wanted to capture that. Remember, she was really into psychology, right? She wanted to capture that, that idea. Um, okay, so here is a quote from Miss Maya Duren. Uh, this film is concerned with the interior experiences of an individual. It does not record an event which could be witnessed by other persons. Rather, it reproduces the way in which the subconscious of an individual will develop, interpret, and elaborate an apparently simple and casual incident into a critical emotional experience. Meshes of the Afternoon is my point of departure. I am not ashamed of it, for I think that as a film, it stands up very well from the point of view of my own development. I cannot help but be gently proud that that first film, that point of departure, had such relatively solid footing. I had been a poet up until then, and the reason that I had not been a very good poet was because actually my mind worked in images, which I had been trying to translate or describe in words. Therefore, when I undertook cinema, I was relieved of the false step of translating image into words and could work directly so that it was not like discovering a new medium so much as finally coming home into a world whose vocabulary, syntax, grammar was my mother tongue, which I understood and thought it, but like a mute had never spoken. Um, it's kind of a cool quote, right? Talking about, talking about how she sort of came about this film. This was Maya's like first film. And it became this famous experimental film that we watch in film classes all across the nation, right? Like this, is, this was her first venture into filmmaking. And I think if we were to sit here and interpret it, we could interpret it a number of different ways, right? Um, we could talk about, you know, her arriving home, but never really arriving home, right? And it would never feel like that before, right? Like feeling like you belong, but then you don't really belong, right? Or, or the relationship aspect between her and the man in the film. That's actually her husband, by the way. Okay, that's actually her husband. Her, her and her husband made this film together. Um, this was her most successful film. She never really made another film to this level of success. And some have suggested that it was because of the pairing of her and her husband, that they made a really good team in working together. They, they ended up divorcing later. Um, and the music that you heard 
was composed a decade or two later by her second husband. <laughs> so does that, does that give you any context for the meaning of the film? If, if you were to know that about her and their relationship and watching the film, does that provide any possible meaning perhaps? Anyone want to take a, make, give it, give it, I see some nodding heads. Give me an interpretation. There's no wrong answer. Go ahead, well, Grant. Uh, um, when she was like holding the knife in the hand and like, I think she was like looking at herself sitting in the, um, sitting in the chair. And then are they, are they the same people like her and herself? her with the knife and like her looking at herself in the chair yeah and then she could be like or asked for projecting um and then she like wakes up and then she looks at the husband and interpret it like her husband is like tormenting her in some way because um like the person who's holding her holding knife it's interesting, like, yeah, it's, like inter the it, it's interesting yes. how the husband became the, the masked sort of hooded figure, right? Like the hooded figure kind of became the husband um, and he arrived home and everything was okay. And then she threw the knife at his face and then it fell through the film in a way, right? Which was interesting as if to say, this is deeper than the film in a way. Um, and then it was him, of course, who found her dead at the end. Um, it's interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Anyone have a different interpretation? Yeah, Chloe, go ahead. I, I agree I, with Grant. I, um, my thought was that um, because it seems like her relationship with her husband and her mental health, what I found interesting was that the thing that she was chasing after, the thing that reflected her uh, – the thing that reflected herself was her husband. So she maybe saw like the reflection of herself through her husband's actions. And that really affected her mental health in a, like a way that confused her, her feel like she wasn't like existing on the same level of like normal as her, her family. So yeah, that's a good point. So it's, it's interesting that she's chasing after this hooded figure and can never quite get there, right? She's chasing after this, chasing after this. And what, what stops her every time? Well, it's her house. It's that home life. So in a way, she's sort of chasing after this escape and she can never capture it. She can never get there. She keeps getting stuck at her home life with a key opening up the doors and going inside, right? That key sort of can represent that sort of domestic life. This was made in the 1940s. What's, what is life like for a woman filmmaker in the 1940s? Well, so- A lot of room for success there? No. <laughs> Maybe not so much, right? I mean, there's women artists, right? But she's clearly doesn't want to be bound to this home life, right? She doesn't want to be bound to this relationship. She's searching for this escape. She's chasing after the escape. I want to be free. We saw all of the things in the slides that she pursued in life, right? She, was, she liked psychology. She liked dance. She liked poetry. She liked painting. She liked this. She liked that. She liked filmmaking. She wanted to try everything. This is a woman who wants to be free. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is a woman who wants to explore the world and adventure and explore life and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, they, she wants to be you know, all over the place and just ex an experiment with life and adventure and all that kind of stuff. And yet every time she tries to reach that destination, she gets stuck at home. Right. And she has this debate with herself at the table. Well, there's three of her. Do I, do I, this, where this, and they keep choosing the key over and over and over again. Right. Until finally we choose some escape. So I think there's a nice link there between what she's feeling and how she wants to be as an artist. Remember, she doesn't want to be constrained Right. We saw that in her quote about Hollywood narrative films. Right. I don't want to be constrained by a plot. Right. I want to be free. I want to explore these ideas and concepts. And I think that's really what she was doing with this film. Um, I'd like to show you the influence of this film um, because this is a very, very influential film. Um, so here um, this set the stage for the modern experimental film. 
Um, it was selected by, for preservation by, in the United States National Film Registry. That means that our government decided this film was so important to our history and our culture that they chose to preserve it in our National Film Registry, which is a library of films. So it'll be saved forever and always and preserved so that future generations can see it because it's important to our culture as an American people. Um, the BBC, our friends across the pond, named the film the 40th greatest American movie ever made. Wow. The 40th greatest American movie ever made. Uh, many artists and musicians uh, have been influenced by this film. They're on the record for having said that this film influenced them in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Stu Frederick, who was an experimental filmmaker out of San Francisco, was very heavily influenced by this film. Um, David Lynch. Good old David Lynch. I love David Lynch. Um, David Lynch is, is Mr. Greco's favorite director, by the way. David Lynch um, is a successful experimental filmmaker who's done some really weird stuff and has successful. He's made some movies that you may or may not have seen. He also made uh, Twin Peaks, which is a, a really great, strange, crazy television show. It's like a comedy and a soap opera and experimental film all rolled into one. It's amazing. Totally different. Uh, the MoMA, um, not too long ago, had an exhibit for works, all works, um, explicitly influenced by meshes of the afternoon. So um, it's a, been a very influential film um, over the years and one that a lot of people have, have gravitated towards as a, as a famous experimental film. Um, she never really did one to this level again. Um, she did other works that were well regarded, but this was, this was the one that really set her apart. This was the one that, that really made everything happen. So your mission your mission, ladies and gentlemen, is you are going to create an experimental film. Now, don't worry. We're not doing it just yet. We're just barely waiting our foot into this. But you are all going to make an experimental film. Um, the experimental film that you're going to make is going to be based, because I realize it's helpful to have some sort of constraint when it's so open-ended. Um, your film will be based on the statement, the conceptual statement that you received in English. So you received a random conceptual statement in English. You recall, I hope, yes, 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 yes. Some people are like, no, I hate that statement. Sorry, sorry, it is what it is. Don't worry, don't worry. You can do a lot of fun things with this statement. We'll talk about it when we do pitches. Um, so you will create a film based around your conceptual statement. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can do this. There's a lot of ways that you can do this. So the next time I see you, it will be Monday. Yes, it will be Monday. Um, and next week is pitch week, which means you will pitch to the class your conceptual statement and your idea for your film. Now, we will be doing this over two class periods, on Monday and on Thursday when the other day that we have class but you need to be prepared to go on Monday um, because you might go you might not you just you don't know you might be elected somebody might elect you to go and you will stand you don't actually have to stand because we're not in the room but you will stand and you will tell us your conceptual statement and then you will tell us your pitch and then we'll talk about your idea for a solid 10-15 minutes and really get a good idea for your experimental film we're going to change all your ideas so don't stress about this too much come up with some ideas think about it um but don't stress too much because when it comes time um you're going to notice that we worked really together as a class to develop your idea and your concept to really create something cool that you're excited about and some of you are going to walk away after monday or after thursday with a totally different plan than you had going into this this idea for your experimental film um, so, uh, I saw some hands. What are you expecting from a conceptual statement? What do you mean? What am I expecting? Like, what does that mean necessarily? So you all have a statement from English, correct? Uh -huh. So you will be using that statement as the, as the theme for your experimental film. So just okay. like, just like Maya Duren sort of explored the idea of psychology and fever dreams as, as Nate put it, right? Um, her conceptual statement may have been something along the lines of I am exploring um, domestic life or freedom or escape 
through, you know, the concept of a fever dream or something like that. That may have been her concept statement if she had one, something like that. So you are going to take your concept statement and you're going to develop something experimental. Remember, experimental films can go many different ways. Remember, and it's not a beginning and a middle and an end. Don't think characters. Don't think story. Don't think, you know, character arc, all that kind of stuff, because this is an experimental work. It's going to be very, very abstract. It's going to be a little bit all over the place. Okay. Any other questions before we go? No. Um, is there any way to find a different one? Because mine kind of sucks. Uh, you're gonna pitch. You're gonna pitch what you pitch, and you'll be surprised what mm. we can come up with. You'll be surprised. There's a lot of ways that we can use metaphor to and symbolism to change your concept statement into something that you didn't realize you were you could do, and you'll you'll be surprised. You'll find that there's it's really really open ended. The concept statement is not a limiting factor. It's just a springboard for you to find something to start with because i find that if we don't start with something um we get lost because it, the, the possibilities are, are really endless okay so next week you will all pitch you will all pitch we'll start on monday be prepared to pitch to the class your idea if you have questions you may email me um if not i look forward to hearing your pitches i have recorded this lesson i will upload it to the youtube channel so that you can watch it again later if your heart desires um, and that is all. I kept you a few minutes late today, but remember, because I totally, totally let you out early the other day. So I'm still, I'm still in the black here. You still owe me minutes. I'll see you later. Farewell. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.